Um, I have a heart for the uh, environment. I served as the chair for the uh, our environmental advisory committee for over 10 years. And um, that this has been, I also did a, an environmental club at our local elementary school, Bridal Path, for about seven years. And this has just been a, a work of um, labor of love for me, and I feel as if this is the most important thing. But there also are some nuisances, uh, like standing water in our yards, that um, can actually affect our uh, properties with flooding, um, of course, also breeding insects, etc., and making it just a, le a less usable um, space for our, our homes to live. So um, we, we thought we would have a, um, a, some solution finders here to um, uh, find out how do we put in rain gardens into our, into our own uh, landscape and our own properties to solve some of these problems. So we brought uh, some experts in with, uh, from the area. Um, so I wanted to introduce um, uh, Madge Monser. She's, a, uh, she's an environmentalist, a lifetime advocate for um, the environment, and also was the chair of the Ambler EAC for the Environmental Advisory uh, Committee. And a master water and, and, a, and a master water set should store it. So she yeah. is an expert and has put them into her yard, and she has such a great wealth of information. I thought she could share that with us. We also brought in from the Penn State Extension, um, Leslie Bass, a master gardener, and she um, is an expert in, um, we thought we could pass that on, spread the news, and make that available. Uh, I also have with us um, today, um, Brian, <laughs> Captain Planet. <laughs> She's been super excited as she calls out. Okay. We only have five with a 12-pack of spray that we need. Spray. Spray. So this is Ryan Rex's best friend. Uh, Ryan Rex is our uh, chairperson for the Environmental Advisory Committee, and his best friend here is with us as we have to plan it in the I'm here because people don't listen to Ryan Rex when he talks about the environment, but when the guy in blue makeup and a green ball comes around. <laughs> then, we can, then we can listen. Yeah. So we want to we want to share the news. We want to make our, you know you you guys available have this information available to make your properties more um, accessible. And so we'll kind of let you take take it away. I'll grab some of these handouts myself. Thank you, Beth, and thank you for all the work that you've done for um, Montgomery Township in growing your community greener. Uh, like I said, my name is Madge Monster. I'm the former chair of the Ambler EAC. I'm also a master watershed steward, which is through the Penn State Extension, I acquired that certification. I am really self-taught. In I've always been an advocate for the environment, and in teaching it to my children through Girl Scouts and as I got older and became an empty master, I really got more involved in my community and learning more about what stormwater is, why we should care, and what we can do about it. And so I'm going to start this presentation by going over stormwater a little bit because it's something that is affecting all of us. And we all know, I mean, today we had a, a big storm. I actually work in Chambersburg four days a week, and we got quite a deluge out there and I hit another piece of it on my way home. We know that we're getting increased storms of increased intensity. And Pennsylvania is one of those states that's going to become much more humid, much warmer, and we're already on track. The first time I heard that was probably about seven years ago, when I was really starting to, to get much more involved in what's going on from an environmental standpoint. And in those seven short years, I've really seen changes that are affecting our community. And stormwater is a huge one. Flooding is becoming much more prevalent. The state is investing millions of dollars in infrastructure, and a large portion of that is going towards, you know, taking care of our bridges and taking care of our waterways and protecting them and protecting our communities from flooding. So what is stormwater? Why should I care? What can I do about it? Who here knows what a watershed is? 
what is your watershed that you live in? Um, wherever we live, we all lived in a watershed. Our huge watershed, we're all in the Delaware River Basin. So all the waterways in this part of Pennsylvania flow into, eventually, the Delaware River. And there's many sub-watersheds. In my community, my little sub-watershed, the creek that runs in my you know, backyard, or two blocks down, is the Rose Valley Creek. And so that's its own little mini watershed. From there, there's the Wissahickon. The Wissahickon is a, a little bit larger, and there's a number of creeks that flow into the Wissahickon. The Wissahickon flows into the Schuylkill River, which is a larger watershed, and the Schuylkill then flows into the Delaware, which flows into the Atlantic. So when we talk about plastics in the ocean, and you're like, I live up here in Montgomeryville. I'm not affecting plastics getting in the ocean, in the Atlantic Ocean. Well, most assuredly, I have seen plastics in the Rose Valley Creek that I know are flowing into the Wissahickon, into the Schuylkill, and the Delaware and the Atlantic Ocean. So that's how it happens. So wherever we, wherever we live, we live in a watershed. And whatever we do on that land is going to affect your watershed. Who here is familiar with the um, Horsham, is that a naval base? Mm -hmm. And PFAS and PFAS contamination? Mm -hmm. How long ago did they stop spraying that firefighting foam? How many years ago? 20 years ago? About 20 years ago. But now we're seeing that a mile away, two miles away, three miles away, that those particles from that firefighting foam has slowly infiltrated the groundwater and made its way to other places. And I think that's such a, a, a really good, you know, a sad one, a very good example of what we do on our land is going to affect our waterways. And so if you put fertilizer on your grass, that's going to get in our waterways. Um, fecal matter. Uh, there's a huge issue. The Chesapeake watershed, which is the middle of the state, Pennsylvania is one of the largest agriculture states. And what affects the Chesapeake uh, basin is the agriculture, the farms, the cow manure that ends up in the waterways. So really working hard in that area to affect change. So my point is, you know, simple things that you you do on your own property can affect change. Something as simple as making sure that you your trash lid on trash days, when you put your trash out, that it is securely closed. So if a storm comes on Tuesday night and you put your trash out and the trash men are going to come Wednesday morning, that you don't have trash flying out of your trash can during a wind event that then turns into a storm and that trash flows down the street into those storm drains. And where do those storm drains empty? Into the creek. Right. There's so many people who don't realize that those storm drains actually drain into our waterways, into our creeks. So any pollutants that are out there on our roadways end up in our creeks. So this just goes over some of Ambler's sub-watersheds. What is storm water? Storm water simply is too much water not absorbed or filtered in the ground. It picks up pollutants and sediments. Sediments is one of the biggest pollutants. What's sediment? Well, here's a really good example of sediment. If you can really take a good look at this, on the right-hand side of this, you'll see that the water is muddy. And on the left-hand side, it's much clearer. This was a property where the resident did some work. And he put up one of those silt socks. You can see the green silt sock. And the, it got smashed from a tractor run, running over it. It's really not doing its job. This big old storm comes along, washes off all that mud and sediment. And that ends up in our creeks. Why is that bad? It's bad because it becomes um, sand and, and sediment that um, 
gets into, it, it fills up all the cobble that's in the creeks. And if there isn't the cobble, which is all the little stones that the water bounces over, then the macroinvertebrates, which are like the insects of the waterways, they don't have a, a habitat. It destroys their habitat. So if you don't have the macroinvertebrates, then that's going to affect everything up the food chain. Once upon a time in the Rose Valley Creek, you could find little crayfish. Once upon a time, along the banks of the Rose Valley Creek, you could hear the keepers in the early spring. Neither one of those exists anymore. So non-point source pollution is the biggest um, pollutant in our waterways. And it comes from runoff from our rooftop, runoff from our gutters, runoff from the street, and all that runoff, because in nature, when it rains, the water just falls onto <coughs> the forest or the meadows, and it infiltrates in place. In populated areas, it rolls off of our rooftops and all of our impervious surfaces, and it picks up paste, pet waste, fertilizers, motor oil, detergents, chemicals and litters, and all of that ends up in our, in our water, waterways. Let's see if we can get this to run. This is a nice little video. We open the faucet and it's always there, clean, safe, and abundant. Water, the essence of life. We need it every day, but we often forget that safe drinking water starts way before it gets to our tap. Before the pipes that lead to our home, even before the complicated process of treatment and disinfection that makes raw water drinkable, it starts here at the source. In Pennsylvania, our source water can be from surface water, like our rivers, lakes, and streams, or groundwater, the aquifers that lie beneath the earth. Public water suppliers tap into these sources to provide us with our drinking water. No matter where our water comes from, it's affected by what happens on the land around it. As we develop the landscape, we create more impervious surfaces and change the natural water cycle. When it rains, Water can no longer seep into the ground. Instead, it travels as runoff, picking up pollutants on its way to rivers and streams. We all contribute to the contamination of our water. Contamination of our source water supplies can cause disease and become very costly to clean. And sometimes that contaminated water might be impossible to clean and the source must be abandoned. Fortunately, it doesn't have to be this way. We can prevent contamination from happening. We can use best management practices on farms and industrial sites. We can manage runoff from roofs and driveways by naturalizing our yards. We can protect green space and create buffer zones along rivers and streams. We can put zoning controls and stormwater regulations in place. Protecting water resources sustains local wildlife, attracts businesses, promotes tourism, and assures a more affordable quality of life for our families and future generations. Clean water benefits all of us. Click here to get started. Stormwater PA has a lot of great resources on stormwater and on what you can do about it, including how to build rain gardens. Um, one, one note I want to make, one point I want to make, is there are, there are two states that have a green amendment in their state constitution. And that green amendment does exist in the state of Pennsylvania. Each one of us, as a resident, has a right to clean air, pure water, and the preservation of the environment. And that includes the aesthetic, and the historic environment as well. And so it's our right to clean water. So it's, 
it's an avenue for us to hold our local governments accountable for assuring that there aren't these pollutants that enter our waterways and that our air is preserved and, and is clean and clear. Um, and I, I think moving forward over the next several years, um, you're going to see more and more people that are going to you know, start to seek that accountability from their local governments because we're not getting clean. <coughs> We're, we're really struggling to move forward. But one thing that we can do is each one of us can be the difference. And we can start on our own properties um, by building rain gardens. So how, how do we build a rain garden? I mean, that's a simple tool that, that we can use um, to... Uh, um, building a rain garden is a simple tool that we can use. Um, some of the threats to our creeks right now are inconsistent water flow, erosion, flash flooding, and polluted runoff. Um, all of that happens when, with these stormwater issues that we're having. We're having um, increased erosion, increased runoff. It's causing lots of flooding. And here's are some simple pictures um, from our community in Ambler about things that are happening. Here is an example of something that you might see when you're walking down the street, out on a walk, I saw this, I'm like, oh, what is this discharge coming from the pipes? This is something that you can do that you can affect change. Is notify your local authorities that you see something that doesn't look right. Call the Montgomery County Township, Montgomeryville Township. Hey, look, I saw this on at this address. Can you just check it out? Or call your local watershed. In this case, I called um, with it and watershed. Here's another example of non-point source um, pollution, and that's salt on our sidewalks. <clears throat> it, is it necessary during storm events to sometimes protect ourselves and residents from icy sidewalks? Absolutely. But it's about being smart about our use of it. And this is way too much salt, first of all. And that salt is going to end up in our waterways. So using salt as necessary when you can affect change through the sun by first shoveling and then letting the sun melt it off, and then sweeping up the salt afterwards. And certainly being mindful of how much salt that you um, do put on your roadways. And municipalities do have a stake in this because any municipality that discharges into creeks has to get a permit in order to discharge into that creek. So I'm pretty sure about that Montgomeryville has an MS4 permit. Yep. And within that MS4, which stands for Municipal, um, municipal Storm Sewer System, Separate Storm Sewer System, um, there are certain things that you need to do. Um, if you have a TMDO, which many municipalities do for sediment and for nutrients, then you have to follow these six minimum control measures. And they're pretty, some of them are pretty basic, like public education and outreach. So right now, your community can take credit for educating all the residents here about stormwater. Because you're all here, this is public education and outreach. Also, public um, involvement and participation. You're here to learn how to build a rain barrel. You go home, you build a rain barrel, you, or build a rain garden, or you get a rain barrel, then you're affecting change. Illicit discharge detection and elimination. That one example I gave you, I've now educated you about what you can do if you see something that doesn't look right. Um, let your municipality know. Construction site, stormwater runoff control, that has to do with construction, and number five has to do with construction. And minimum control measure number six is the municipality, um, their public works department playing their role in protecting our waterways. Also, um, that stormwater PA site, they have a list of best management practices. There is a whole manual that was just recently updated working with Villanova University on best management practices. And we're going to talk about one of those best management practices um, right now. Any questions so far?
So how to build a uh, rain garden. What is a residential rain garden? Anybody here have a rain garden on their property? All right. So is it, how many of you are familiar with rain gardens? Okay, we got a few of you. Great, so a rain garden is an indentation. Um, it's a shallow indentation that's landscaped with deep-rooted, preferably native vegetation that filters rainwater directed from impervious surfaces like rooftops via downspouts. So this actually is a rain garden in Ambler, and you can see that um, right in the middle there that there is a... Um, Right here is the downspout that directs the water from the rooftop into this rain garden that's planted with lots of native plants um, to take up water. So a rain garden is your personal contribution to cleaner water. Um, reducing stormwater runoff increases water that filters into the ground, so it's going to recharge groundwater. It's going to help to protect your community from flooding and drainage issues. And it protects our waterways from pollutants like fertilizers, oils, debris, and sediments. It also adds an aesthetic beauty and increases your property value. As well, it also provides habitat for birds, bees, and butterflies. Have uh, any of you heard of the plight of the monarch butterfly? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, many of you have. And that's a really good example of how um, in our development and in our agricultural practices, we um, decrease the habitat for um, the monarch butterfly so it no longer has a place to lay its eggs. One of the great things about rain gardens is it's a great place to plant milkweed. What rain gardens do is retain pollutants and it, they also reduce stormwater value and it helps with filtration of coarse particles. So this is a schematic that kind of goes over a rain garden and you can see the flow of water goes from this gutter right here down this downspout. And let's go back. And it goes, um, flows down into this indentation where there are native plants. Um, sometimes you have to add soil amendments to allow the water to percolate. Um, sandy soil, sand, coarse sand is really helpful in rain gardens. And in our, some of our downspout planter boxes that we use, we use a stormwater mix that has 70% coarse sand, 20% um, compost, and 10% topsoil. And then there's a berm on the one side to hold back the, the um, water so that it stays in place. Frequently asked questions about rain gardens. <coughs> rain gardens should not form ponds. They are meant to infiltrate stormwater within 48 hours, really. They do not breed mosquitoes um, if it's properly built and it can infiltrate the water because mosquitoes take much longer than 48 hours to develop. Rain gardens should not require any more maintenance than regular flower beds, and proper mulching the first two years will decrease your weeding. Rain gardens don't have to be expensive. Typically, three to five square feet, if you're self-built, 17 to $20. That's probably gone up a little bit. Um, if you hire a landscaper. Finding a landscaper who knows how to build a rain garden can be really challenging. <laughs> that is something that is, it, rain gardens are a newer type of landscape feature. So there's a lot of landscape architects who will help you to build a rain garden. Um, finding the actual landscaper who knows the ins and outs of rain gardens is you know, slowly coming into being. Um, this is just another schematic with um, a home rain garden that was built. Here's a, a rain barrel. You can have a rain barrel, water that flows into a rain barrel, and then the overflow can flow into a rain garden. 
So design process step number one is to identify potential rainwater sources and how to direct them into a garden. So any place where you have a downspout is a potential avenue for a rain garden. If you have a downspout that's flowing onto an impervious surface, that is the best place, the best scenario for finding an avenue to create a rain garden. Because you want to really try to capture that water that's flowing off of your property. Your goal is to keep your water on your property and allow it to infiltrate in place. So if you have that downspout that flows onto your driveway and then your driveway flows out into the street, is there an avenue for redirecting that downspout into a rain garden that is maybe alongside of your driveway? Or maybe a little bioswale, which is very similar to a rain garden, only it's an elongated, almost like a gully that you would then um, plant. Uh, design process number two is measuring the areas that will collect the water to determine the water volume. This doesn't have to be rocket science. So basically, you want to take a look at that downspout and how much of your rooftop is flowing into that downspout. So if you have a downspout, this is your back side of your roof, and you have two downspouts, and your roof is roughly 15 feet by 30 feet, then you're going to just take half of that and say, okay, well, half the water goes in this downspout and half goes in this downspout. So you're going to take seven and a half feet times 15 feet and get your square footage. Your rain garden should be about a third of the size of that, that area. So about one third of that area. And I think, Derek, are you going to, will this, can I email this to you and can you email it to the people? Yeah, that absolutely. I'll email the, uh, the video as well as the PowerPoint if that's okay. Okay, that's great. Because there's some links on here that are really helpful that take you, um, you know, so that you can get more information on how to size rain gardens. Um, it doesn't need to be that complicated. So here in this example, um, you know, determining the amount, it roughly it needs to be about a third of the size figured out your rooftop. Um, and that's for a one inch storm. We're getting storms that are much greater than one inch these days. So, you know, taking that into consideration Starting to size, we're starting to size our rain gardens a little bit bigger um, because we are getting those larger storms. So next you want to determine where to locate your rain garden. Some key things, it should be at least 10 feet from any foundation. You don't want water in your basement. You want it to integrate it with your landscape so that, you know, it flows. Um, a sunny or partly sunny locations are best, but a shade garden is possible. A lot of times if you have a shade garden, you want to be mindful, is that shade from the way your house is positioned, so it's the shade of the house. You do really want to avoid the underneath the trees and um, get outside of the grip line of trees. <coughs> Contrary to popular belief, a rain garden should not be located where water ponds because that's already telling you that there's an issue right there with infiltration. And if you want to build a rain garden, um, sometimes you can affect change by just planting up an area that's soggy, plant it with water-loving plants and maybe some trees that don't mind wet roots. And eventually, over time, that can help to take care of that soggy area. Um, the other thing you can do is you can sometimes redirect that water to another area where maybe there's better infiltration, or you can remediate the soil in that area, which would require you know, really digging out some of that soil and replacing it with a really coarse sanding mix. You can also get a, um, what is that tool called? Auger, large auger, 
and go down three or four feet and make several of these holes in the ground and fill them with um, stone and coarse sand. The flatter the site, the better. You want less than a 12% slope. Um, do not locate over a septic system. Avoid building under large trees. Consider the downspout that drains the most roof runoff and plan where the overflow will go. With these larger storms, um, you're gonna have overflow. Where, where are you gonna direct that overflow? Next, you wanna test your soil to determine its infiltration rate. You know, is it appropriate? Your soil must drain at least a quarter inch of water per hour to be suitable for a rain garden. And really, you can make this as simple as digging a hole 12 inches deep, putting in a tape measure, filling the hole with water, and waiting for it to infiltrate and seeing how fast it goes down. And there's a couple of um, examples on here of how to do an infiltration test that, that go over it. Um, if you don't have good infiltration, you need to remediate the soil. Do not think that, oh, it'll be fine, because I, I've already made that mistake. <laughs> and it was pretty challenging to remediate it after the fact. We had to take all the plants up, and we had to actually really put in um, an infiltration pit in this one place. A lot of this area around here has clay-like soil, and that clay soil really makes it really challenging. So be mindful of um, making sure that you have good infiltration. Size the garden in depth. The typical size of a rain garden is 100 to 300 square feet, feet based on a one inch storm. Um, the design area should be level and flat. The average depth of a rain garden is four to eight inches. Typically our rain gardens were about eight inches. You want the sides to slope gently into the rain garden. Um, and really you don't want your rain garden greater than 12 inches deep. Um, it's better to have a larger shallow rain garden than a smaller deep rain garden. Berms help to keep the water contained, and there should be inflow and uh, overflow points. Um, design process step number six is determine the shape and general appearance of the garden in the existing landscape. Um, Oval-shaped or kidney-shaped gardens are um, typically best. You want to keep the ratio of length to width at least two to one, so the water can kind of flow in, spread out. Like I said, kidney, oval, teardrop shape, longer length, perpendicular to inflow. Installation. Before you dig, you want to call 811 because you don't want to run into something that you weren't expecting. You want to make sure you avoid gas lines, water lines, um, your electric lines that are coming in. So do call 811. It's free, you just call them, you tell them what you're doing, where you're digging, you mark the site, they'll send out the utility companies that will mark where all the lines are. Installation. So to begin with, we outline the site with spray paint so you can kind of get an idea. I've also used a hose or some rope so that you can kind of play around with it before you outline it with paint. Um, and then you want to just remove all the grass and then dig your rain garden. Homeowners, if you are tired of paying too much money for electricity and have a history of paying your bills off, some soils, such as compacted soil, do not absorb water as quickly as others. Amendments, such as sand, topsoil, and compost, can be added to compacted soils to reduce the density and increase the permeability. Use the excess soil you have extracted from the site to build a burn on the downhill side of your garden. This will help trap runoff and allow the water more time to infiltrate into your rain garden. 
Once you have amended the soil and built the berm, you can move on to step four, which is planting your garden in native plants. So in your installation, as I said, dig out and level. You want the bottom of your rain garden to be level. Um, so you want to make sure that um, you can use some stakes and on either end and put a rope in between so that you know what your level point is and you're able to, to dig it out. And then build up that burn on the low side. Here's an example of a rain garden and you can see that the base of the rain garden, all of this is level. And you want the base of your rain garden to be level so that you have good infiltration. At this point, if you've had some issues with infiltration, this is when you want to put in um, your sand wicks, which are those holes that you use your auger and create those sand wicks. Fill them with stone and fill them with, um, with uh, coarse sand. Use the excess soil to build the berm at the low end, and then you're going to start your planting. Till the soil and amend as necessary with a sand and compost mixture, and you can use that, that roto-till to really get it in there. Prepare the overflow. So at one end of your garden, you're going to want to have like a little saddle, a little indentation, so that when we get those huge storms, which are going to happen, you want to be able to direct the water. So you're going to build that little saddle and then we cover that saddle with stone, with river rock, typically. You want the overflow to be high enough to allow the rain garden to fill to the required depth, but lower than the inlet to prevent it from backing up. <coughs> and we actually, we had one rain garden that we put in that it was actually draining a backyard. They had put in some French drains and taken a lot of the water from the backyard to the front and we were directing it instead of into the driveway into a, a larger rain garden that was alongside of the driveway. When we got that six inch storm that came through, what was that, last year, the year before? September <coughs> 1st. It, yeah, it completely it backed up into their backyard and started to flood, um, come into their, their um, back patio doors. And it was because the saddle wasn't quite right. And so we had to lower the saddle a little bit so that the overflow could flow out. So it is really important to get that right. <clears throat> That's an extenuating circumstance. I mean, we did have six inches of rain. A rain garden isn't made to handle six inches of rain. Typically, we build them to handle our, our average storm, which is up to one inch. And then you want to direct the rain, the water to the rain garden. And there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. You can do it on top of the ground, or you can do it under the ground. So you can take your downspout, and you can run your downspout like they're doing in this top picture here. Um, it looks like here they actually went underneath underneath the sidewalk and then or, or the front walkway and then brought it through this perforated um, corrugated piping um, to flow into the rain garden. Here's another example where it's flowing from this downspout here underground into this rain garden. Um, this is a, I actually employed this technique at my property uh, with going across a walkway and we put stone in the walkway and my water now flows across in, that way into a rain garden. So there's a lot of different ways that, that you can get it into the rain garden. Or you can do something right on top. If you're a rain garden, you can flow it across the top. The concern there though, if you're flowing, if you have something um, if you just direct a much longer downspout um, across your, your yard or whatever surface area into the rain garden is, is now, you, you know, 
What are you going to have? Do you have grass there? How are you going to mow around that? My neighbor actually has a downspout that unfurls, unfolds, and so when it rains, it all just kind of unfolds and then flows over into the rain garden. The next thing you want to do is plant your rain garden in your level base. You want to mark out the location based on the mature size of the plants. So when you're putting your plants in, typically we plant plugs or smaller plants. You want to take into consideration how they're going to be when, um, when they're large. And there's a lot of, there's some planting videos here and um, native plants are best based on location in the garden. And then the final thing is maintenance. Maintenance is essential to assure proper function. Weeding is much greater in the first two years while those plants are growing in. Mulch can help to keep the weeds down during the first couple of years. After that, you really shouldn't have to mulch as much. Um, the mulch really is there to um, keep the weeds down while those plants are filling out. Once those plants fill out, uh, you should be pretty good. You do need to check the inlets periodically for debris. Our inlets, frequently we put a little drain um, on them to keep um, any rodents from going up and creating a little nest. So you want to pull that out and pull out any debris that's flowed down. Yes? Um, we bought a house a year ago and your hair is a rain guard. Uh, with no instruction or do's or don'ts from the previous owner or couch. Uh, you mentioned mulch. What kind of mulch? Do we like the whole depot? Do we have to so use more when, natural? So when it comes to mulch, I typically recommend uh, that triple shredded natural mulch. You can get it from holidays. You know, moving more towards, you know, non-dive, regular mulch, um, I think is beneficial for our environment. And that's what we recommend to our residents. Okay, what is regular mulch? Uh, is it, it's not dive. Triple shredded Shredded mulch. what? Tree? Bark. What is yeah. shredded bark? What is bark? Okay. Yeah. And if you just say, do you have triple shredded um, mulch, um, if you call holidays, yeah. they'll know what you're talking about. And then it comes in different colors. You can get it in black, you can get it in red, or you can just get natural. And the natural is what I recommend. Okay, and again, because we inherited it, now it's just totally weeds, you know, mm -hmm. 50 feet, 6 inch wide, totally weeds. Uh, I know enough not to use like Roundup or anything, but what is <laughs> Redtail restoration. Redtail does that kind of thing. They'll come out and they will weed your flower beds for you, and they charge by the hour. <clears throat> and you know that might it might be useful sometimes, like once or twice a year, to get somebody in that knows native plants and knows the difference between a weed and something that's flowering, and you know can help support getting the weeds out so your native plants can start to flourish and have them take over rather than the weeds. Thank you. There, you, there's even, even, you might even uh, contact like a local little boy scout troop that might be looking for service hours, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, there are a lot of groups that are doing this and say we're trying to re rehabilitate a rain garden. They're going to be all over that. There are also environmental clubs at the cool. area high school. The Enact Club, they may come in and volunteer for that as well. Thank you. Good points. We need to have young people doing these hard works. Do you recommend horticultural vinegar? Horticultural vinegar? Yeah, a, a strong vinegar. 30%. Yeah, uh, to kill weeds? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I, well, that's easy. Yeah, yeah. I use, my husband uses a, like a vinegar that he sprays right on the leaves. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And you know, when, sometimes when you get some.
something um, really stubborn. Like currently, I have thistle really bad that has started to take over. And Roundup does have its place, but I don't not in spray. But if you dab it on, if you cut and dab it right on, as soon as you cut it, dab it right on to the, the cut, and then that plant will soak it up, and it will help to you know, get into the root structure and, and kill that plant. And that way you're just using it locally and not you know, everywhere. And for stubborn things, that's the only thing. Yeah, bamboo is another really good example where we've used it in our um, in eradicating some um, some invasive bamboo in one of our parks. Here's just a couple of pictures of some of our rain gardens in action. Um, you can see sometimes we get a lot of water. Um, Here's an inflow. This is an inflow coming in, and you can see there's some milkweed right here that's growing in that rain garden. Um, here's the downspout here flowing into this garden right here. And this is a rain garden that was at a, over off of Route 73 at a senior facility. And it was actually the local school that worked with the senior facility to um, educate their the facility about better stormwater management. And then they worked with um, the school and this, this teacher in particular to incorporate this rain garden. So it became an education process for the students and it supported better stormwater management for this community. And let's see if I can escape from here. And here. So here is a rain garden in process. So this was a property, and we took this downspout right here. And we wanted, if you take a look right here, this was a sump pump from the basement. And the water from this part of the roof all flowed out into the street. And so what we wanted to do was cut this off and bring this back onto the property. Because the goal is to allow water to infiltrate in place. So we worked with um, Rick DePietro landscaping, and this was a small landscaper that I found that used to be, he used to pull weeds, he was a small horticulturalist guy, and I'm like, hey Rick, do you want to learn how to build rain gardens? <laughs> and so I worked with Rick, and together we worked on building up his business in how to build rain gardens. And this was uh, the first rain garden that he built, which actually was on um, my property. And this was a pretty extensive rain garden build. It was a pretty big rain garden. And you can see that there's a bit of a slope here. I appreciate that Rick hires women to help do the grunt work. <laughs> and that, that's Molly there, uh, not afraid to you know, get a shovel and, and throw around some dirt. But you see, we took all the soil off. We had done an infiltration test. We were a little bit concerned, so we were gonna put in lots of sand wicks on this property um, because it was some tough clay soil. Um, down here was where our overflow was gonna be because it seemed kind of natural. That's just them working really hard. And here we are, um, you can barely see this. We have some rope going across here. This is so that we can get it level. And you can see the beginnings of the berm on the downside over here. And so here we are taking all that soil, building up the berm. And then we had to really, um, yeah. <laughs> so sometimes you start to work on a rain garden, challenging to get through and to really get down there. So we had our auger, we had so many different tools. It was just really tough soil. But we were persistent 
and slowly it started to take shape. This is where we cut that, that um, pipe that went out to the street. And so that was going to be our new inflow. This is the auger. We're creating sandwiches here. That's my husband in blue. Yeah. Hey, honey, can you do this for me? He's so good. And so this is the rain garden before we actually plant it. So you can see right here that our inflow is right here. And this is the flat part of the rain garden. And here's our berm right here. Our saddle is going to end up being up here. And we're just starting to lay out the plants, you know, where we want them. And we had a lot of shrubs that we put in. <clears throat> this is Hazel right here. She's our mascot. You're such a good dog. And, you know, start to lay out your plants and then put them in place. So, yeah, we had a, a redbud tree that we put in. This was, a, this was a really big project. All these bags right here, these were to fill in the sand wicks with some coarse stone. And my husband did such a nice job with this inflow. You know, he kind of created this little stone area around it so it, it looked decorative and it wasn't just a pipe flowing into um, the rain garden. And so this was after we got it planted. And you can see here's the inlet. And we still don't have our berm in place. But there's your rain garden. And you see how spaced out a lot of these plants are? Because we need to think about, you know, the, the future, about how much space they're going to take up. This is after it was mulched. And our, our saddle ended up being over here. I think it didn't, you don't see it in this picture. I think we put it in a little bit later. But there's your inlet right there coming in perpendicular to the lane. Let's see. Do I have this? This was in a little bit later in the fall. This was the first. So we planted that in September, and then this was the next spring. Um, it's just starting to come into bloom. So it, it's just starting to fill in a little bit. This is it a little bit later in the season. Starting to fill in. Our township is befuddled a little bit on what to do as we decrease the amount of grass we have and create more and more plantings. And actually, this whole area over here has now all become um, native plants. So that's another movement, is moving away from grass and moving more towards um, planting native, native yards and um, so, any questions? That's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. 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 It is, it is, you can also do much, that was a big rain garden. There's some smaller rain gardens that we've done. Um, let's see if I have. Not to mention the tools that you need. Yeah, that was a tough rain garden to build. Um, 33 Orange Avenue. This one. That's great, you guys did one of the row homes. Yeah, oh yeah, we did. We've done a few on some of the row homes there. Uh, Stormwater picture. Joe Giampa. This was a nice rain garden to build. This one was like my easiest sell. I was putting in a downspout planter next door, and the guy walked over and said, what are you doing? And I started to talk to him about stormwater. He's like, OK, I'll take one. <laughs> I'm like, great. And he actually put this rain garden in. I don't know if I have a current picture or no. He put the rain garden in, and it was his dad's house, and he was selling the house. But he wanted to sell it with the rain garden. Um, he does a lot of work for um, Jenny Carey, Jen, Jenny Carey, oh, Jen 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 yes, yeah. Temple Ambler. So yeah. he is like, turns out he's like her, her guy, his, her guy oh, okay. that does all the maintenance work on her property. 
Huh? And he was so excited to put in this rain garden, and then he put in, you know, some uh, uh, bird feeders, and and the new homeowners that bought it, interesting story, they were actually from Philadelphia. And they had done the rain check program in Philadelphia, and learned all about um, rain gardens down south, planter boxes, and rain barrels. And when they saw this rain garden, they knew exactly what it was, because they had taken the program in Philadelphia on um, stormwater management. And so they were so excited to have a rain garden because their property in Philadelphia, they couldn't put a rain garden in place. Here's another rain garden um, that we put in quite some time ago. Um, here's some pictures of it. And then this homeowner, so the grass was starting to, you know, kind of come up over the berm. So what she did was pull it all back and then she put river rock around it to, you know, help to keep some of the, the grass from growing in. That one's been in and along for quite some time. These are our downspout planter boxes that we put in place. And these are, they're, they're a stormwater tool that you can use. They're not the most efficient, but they at least say, hey, I'm doing something about stormwater. And so your downspout flows into the downspout planter box. It has a false bottom in it, so it can act as a rain barrel in terms of holding back 50 gallons of water during a storm event. And then it has slow release. And then this is the overflow right here. And that overflow then, previously this downspout flowed into a driveway. And so now it comes out like out in the middle of the yard over here. And there's a little um, uh, rocky area where the water can infiltrate into 